A very good day to everyone. I hope you're all well and have been participating actively in the workshops for the last few days. I see lots of familiar names, so that's a positive. Um, just to introduce myself again, I'm Nabila from UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei, and I will be facilitating this session. First and foremost, welcome to day three of the SME SDG Festival workshops as part of our SDG Ambition Month. Thank you all for joining us in on this session titled Maju Series 2, Justify and Upgrade, Raising the Bar. So before we start, I would like to highlight on a few things first. Um, we would appreciate if participants could keep your mic on mute and your camera turned off. And for the best experience, please view this in speaker's view. Please also note that this session is recorded um, and if you're having any connectivity issues, please feel free to restart by leaving the call and jumping in again. We welcome you to be interactive as well during the session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box below. I hope this is clear for everyone. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. So to start, I'd first like to thank our very own trainer, Izzy Safrid from UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei for hosting this session. Um, with this, I'll invite Easy to introduce himself and get on the workshop. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Nabila. Hi, everyone. My name is Easy. Nice to meet you again. I'm sure I've, I see some uh, familiar names. Welcome to day uh, three of the uh, SFF21 uh, Learning and Development um, Series. Huh? So today we'll be doing Maju Series 2, which is looking at uh, Justify and Upgrade. Uh, a very quick uh, I'm, I'm going to do a very quick recap of uh, what has transpired them. so this session is uh, sponsored by Sarawak Energy in fact Sarawak Energy was the one that actually uh, that uh, sponsored the entire Maju framework to make it available uh, to the SMEs uh, for free um, these are just the house rules uh, so basically uh, we're not going to have any breaks uh, because it's just a one hour session and then uh, get your put your handphones on silent mode uh, if you're unclear about anything please do uh, please uh, ask you can type it in the chat box or you can uh, ask uh, uh, during the session and then uh, respect everyone's opinion um, in this case of course partic this is going to be more like a webinar we've got about an hour and then let's agree to disagree you whatever you if you disagree with something again you can uh, type it in the chat box and then uh, this is not really um, uh, suitable for this uh, when it comes to dressing but uh, we always maintain that you know even when you are doing online do uh, dress up uh, appropriately yeah? and then uh, we welcome honest feedback uh, because we just want to improve on uh, our delivery of uh, services eh? and I want you all to have fun so I hope the last uh, two days has been uh, great or rather the, the week uh, during this SSF. I hope you have leveraged on the opportunities for learning. Okay, so this is based on the Maju framework. So we've done mission activity. Today we'll be doing justify and upgrade them. So this framework was, uh, was uh, created for SMEs eh, to enable them to jump on the sustainability bandwagon. But of course, when you look at sustainability it can be complex. Uh, SMEs cannot approach sustainability like uh, the big boys can so we've made it simple uh, and practical so we did the SWOT analysis basically this looks at uh, how you are going to account for your internal strength and weaknesses and then look at your opportunities and threats from an external perspective eh? so we did this on the Maju series part one um, then we did the SME, the Guide to Materiality, which is a basic foundation to any good sustainability uh, practice. Eh? Um, so we looked at uh, materiality, looking at what are the important things that matters most to all your stakeholders. And then we created a chart to look, uh, then you are using this materiality matrix, then we look at how you are going to uh, superimpose uh, the identity of your stakeholders and also the indicators, be it uh, the sustainable development goals or whatever are the indicators uh, which are relevant to your business. Uh, and then we did the decision making matrix tools often because when we make decisions based on emotions, the outcomes are never that great. So we, uh, we use 
what we do is we use this uh, um, decision making matrix analysis to use a logical uh, approach to decision making and this is important simply because when it comes to sustainability um, there might be a lot of questions whether we should go with option A, B or C and often when you find um, there are uh, options available which are not so obvious in terms of uh, which one to go for so the decision making matrix analysis helps so we went through the uh, very quick uh, way of how to complete the and use the decision making uh, an analysis eh? and then we did the one page sustainability canvas uh, this is a great way a great tool for creating a common language for both internal and stakeholders uh, <coughs> particularly i like the use of the uh, sustainable business model canvas as a way to engage internal uh, staff uh, your especially for smes to get your staff on board to make them part of the company to enhance uh, stakeholder uh, employee engagement so that they feel part of the company and they will understand the vision the mission and also the bis the entire business uh, operations eh? this is important because uh, today when you work with the millennials eh, uh, they are already uh, coming uh, on board and they are slowly moving up to uh, management level and then a lot of them are also uh, young startups uh, they run their own SME so it's important that uh, they, they become part of your company by uh, engaging them through this uh, sustainable business model canvas eh? and it's also a great tool uh, when you use it externally to invite collaboration with other um, parties eh? whether it be your supply chain your logistics your uh, channels and so on and so forth um, so that was the sustainable um, business model canvas today what we are going to be doing is uh, as part of the justify and upgrade of course when you look at uh, uh, <coughs> sustainability uh, out of the materiality matrix uh, where you have identified what the indicators are and who your stakeholders are the next step is actually to look at uh, <coughs> what are the concerns and how you are going to report against those concerns uh, as you progress or as you implement your sustainability uh, programs or projects eh? so the sustainability balance scorecard is a way to look uh, from a strategic standpoint on what are the things that you want to measure of course when we talk about uh, justification uh, under MAJU uh, M -A -J -U, under justification it is not only about um, coming up with the reports but it's also about how you are going to disseminate those reports how you are going to um, engage your stakeholders that you've identified through the materiality matrix to look at how you can continuously keep them uh, posted or updated with your sustainability performance however because this is just a one hour session uh, seminar uh, what i want to do here is focus on those that are critically or most important uh, for the two topics of justify and upgrade so we have three tools in total uh, encompassing justify and upgrade and eh? when we look at uh, sustainability balance scorecard uh, before you want to report anything it's important that you know what you're going to report it's important that you know what you are going to measure so this is where the sustainability balance scorecard comes into the picture eh? so it's important that we also agree on what sustainability means uh, for um, SMEs eh? so what do we mean by sustainability in the context of SMEs it can be talking about sustainable products um, it can also be a sustainability strategy but by definition uh, what we all can agree is that uh, sustainability encompasses the triple bottom line uh, people uh, which is social and then you have uh, profits which is economy and then you have planet which is the environment uh, it's more popularly known uh, because of shell eh? shell started this triple bottom line reporting so we have people planet profit which is kind of easy to remember uh, three piece okay so when we look at sustainability balance scorecard what is it that we want to report so a better approach to sustainability kpis would be formulating first uh, you need to 
uh, formulate a sustainability strategy which uh, we have done in parts one looking at your sustainability SWOT analysis then looking at your decision making to assist with uh, what uh, your direction is going to be what programs to take for example you can use the decision making matrix to decide on that and then uh, we have the sustainability business canvas and of course the materiality matrix eh? but when you take all this into consideration then you would have uh, a good i would say a good basis for coming up with a sustainability strategy for your organization again uh, smes by nature uh, may not have the necessary tools uh, competencies may not have the talent to actually carry out sustainability like the big boys like the private listed uh, public listed companies but it's okay the the whole idea is to start small uh, and then you learn and then you improve eh? so uh, by coming up with a sustainability strategy you would then need to translate that into what we call uh, a vision and a strategy eh? vision is very 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 important simply because a vision tells uh, where you want to what is your heading eh? what is your bearing and you need to come up with a vision and also mission eh? uh, so that you are able to explain to people what is it that uh, where it is that you are heading and then also how you plan on getting there which is the mission eh? so once you've done this it's easier to translate your kpis based on the vision and the mission okay so quantifying the strategy uh, by adding some relevant performance measures may include uh, energy so you're looking at energy consumption you're looking at water consumption you're looking at waste whether it is what you are uh, recycling uh, it can be based on your toxic emissions uh, if you're in manufacturing it can also be direct emissions in terms of your carbon emissions eh? So these are some of the suggested but these are more operational in nature and on the right hand side you have uh, the sustainability balance scorecard eh? okay so this is basically what it looks like uh, the sustainability balance scorecard okay so this is so embarrassing <laughs> let me just make that change <laughs> okay it bothers me <laughs> okay All right, so uh, coming back to the sustainability balance scorecard, it has uh, five components looking into it. Um, so it has uh, five components, financial perspective, customer perspective, internal business processes, learning and growth, and non-market perspectives. Uh, they all converge around the vision and strategy, the vision, mission, and also your strategy. Um, what's important to note here is that um, you need to look at how you are going to define uh, the environmental, social and economic uh, aspects uh, in relation to your business. Eh? So the first step that you want to do is, it does not matter as long as you can think of something that is along the uh, environmental and social aspect, you just jot it down. Eh? That is That would be the first step. Jot everything down that you can think of. Uh, it doesn't matter you don't need to check at this point in time in terms of its uh, relevance or whether it makes sense whether it's good or bad it doesn't matter because the whole idea here is to sift through the pool of uh, ideas that you have eh? so it may some of it may be strategic uh, some of it may uh, or may not um, align to your vision or to your mission but that's okay as i said so just uh, list them down eh? So the next step is to define the relevance to the identified uh, environmental and uh, social aspects. Eh? So this is where we start to break up. So based on the list that you have prepared, then maybe uh, what I would suggest as an easy way of doing it is to take out what is relevant and put it in the appropriate boxes uh, whether it's financial customer internal or learning and growth or non-market perspective uh. so let's begin with financial perspective uh. so you need to define your financial targets here uh. so this is actually a direct uh, or indirect reference to perspectives two uh, to five so when you look at um, number two customer perspective what are the financial perspectives uh, in relation to customer perspective 
what are the financial perspective in relation to number three what are the financial perspectives in relation to number four as an example using number four as an example you may want to look at what is the uh, budget allocated for learning and development especially in terms of uh, sustainability knowledge uh, uh, enhancing sustainability competency that could be one uh, another example of uh, under learning and growth um, although it is difficult to do but you may want to look at uh, how uh, putting your employees through a curated or highly defined sustainability um, programs can contribute to cost savings or even uh, enhancing revenue that could actually, that could be one of the uh, financial perspectives eh? so uh, you list everything down under financial perspectives okay then going on to number two you look at the customer perspective eh? uh, this is where you define target groups to, that can help achieve your um, ambitions your sustainability ambitions eh? so you're looking at uh, say for example again it's kind of abstract but you can you could look into say for example if you're manufacturing um, FMCGs eh? um, healthcare or personal care uh, products so who are going to be your target audience is it going to be the older generation is it going to be the baby boomers definitely not if you're looking at uh, growth in terms of consumers uh, the millennials are uh, are, are becoming uh, a force in retail eh? so are they your target audience so you need to look at uh, you need to look at how you're going to uh, identify these people target them and then put them under your customer perspective eh? so you need to look at uh, areas in terms of health aspect uh, uh, when you look at the customer perspective uh, let's talk about millennials so you may want to measure certain things in terms of um, <coughs> what are the <coughs> excuse me what are the health uh, aspects of your products is it uh, chemical free for example uh, and then you may also want to look at um, demand for green products so maybe in your fmcg in terms of healthcare products uh, what is the size of the market what is the market penetration what is the brand penetration so this can be some of the customer perspectives that you want to look at eh? and then you may also want to look at uh, what is currently trending uh, perhaps uh, you may find that uh, customers are becoming more vocal today simply because when you shop online they are able to give you reviews and then there are many influencers uh, through social media such as YouTube using uh, TikTok for example and so these are some of the things that you may want to look at measuring uh, on top of just measuring of course you can also use the same channels to uh, get the customer perspective and also influence on the customer perspective to sell more products or to uh, enhance your revenue huh? okay so when we talk about uh, box 3 this is internal business processes huh? so this is looking at the, the processes which requires the perspectives of uh, box number 1 and box number 2 huh? so this is looking more at the internal business processes um, this is operational it looks into you can measure the stuff such as innovation uh, operational efficiency you can look at services and these are measured in terms of uh, environmental and social relevance eh? so this is uh, one uh, aspect that you can look at measuring is the earlier three that I mentioned uh, energy uh, waste or water uh, consumption eh? so this is where you put down the um, the, res uh, the resource use that I showed earlier eh? so this covers the internal business uh, perspectives and then number four very important to sustainability because not everyone understands uh, sustainability uh, we are very much at the nascent stage especially for SMEs so there is a need to uh, enhance uh, learning and development eh? when you look at the balance scorecard which was introduced by Kaplan um, the the um, 
business balance scorecard also incorporates all these five elements but what we've done differently here is that we are looking more from a sustainability standpoint we are applying a sustainability lens to it so that uh, we can then drive business performance uh, we can drive business measurements towards sustainability um, the question now is uh, while I'm on the topic is can you mix together your actual business balance scorecard together with your sustainability balance scorecard would that be a better practice whether you want to maintain two balance scorecards one on business purely business and then another one purely on sustainability so that is the question eh? uh, for beginners the recommendation is that you merge the two uh, in other words, if you are going to focus on your balance scorecard, your business balance scorecard, then you can consider including uh, one or two sustainability uh, KPIs into your balance scorecard. However, um, maintaining two uh, separate scorecards, uh, though feasible, it's doable, uh, some um, small companies actually manage on two uh, different balance scorecards. But the big boys usually what they do is that they combine because they have a more strategic look at it and then they are able to break it down into meaningful action items going from the uh, department, uh, go, sorry, going from the division to the department and um, rolling it down all the way to the individual through their performance management system. So this is how uh, the big boys do it but I think it is uh, also doable for SME simply because um, you don't have to manage um, sustainability like the big boys but you can then use the balance scorecard by incorporating uh, two KPIs within your uh, balance scorecard as uh, the original balance scorecard which is your balance scorecard. Eh? So now coming back to learning and growth. So learning and growth is important uh, because things continuously change. Eh? Technology, if you remember, uh, cars were on a life cycle of about 10 years. And then uh, the Europeans followed the Japanese. So now uh, cars are on a life cycle of about four years. Eh? Technology was the same. Uh, every now and then we have Pentium 1, 2, 3, 4, and then i3, i5. But today, uh, the speed of introduction of new uh, updates, uh, new chips, uh, new handphones happen uh, sometimes even in less than a year. So things continually change, uh, the business environment changes because customers' uh, perspectives change, uh, uh, financial perspectives change, so we need to continuously learn, so you need to invest in uh, learning. Eh? So this is where you put down the uh, sustainability KPIs. You may have, your HR may uh, have already planned uh, annual sustain, um, learning and development uh, calendar eh, for your employees. So. One suggestion is that if you're looking at um, learning and growth and what would be the sustainability KPI, it could be measured in terms of number of hours, total hours uh, in your um, learning calendar or per pack, per uh, number of uh, learning days per staff. Huh? You could look at instead of three days of learning in a year, you could look at uh, two plus one maybe two days the business learning and plus one day of uh, sustainability learning uh, instead of days you could also break that down in terms of um, in terms of hours eh? uh, you could also look at perhaps another suggestion is ensuring that every learning and development intervention incorporates at least 30 percent uh, content on sustainability which i think is actually a better approach because today no matter the subject sustainability always has a place in it eh? so it's better to embed a sustainability learning uh, make it 30 percent of all the contents of your learning calendar and these are the things that you want to measure uh, so you want to measure the environmental and social relevance eh, in terms of how your uh, perhaps it could also be as part of learning and growth you could also do 
uh, employee engagement surveys to look at um, improving the understanding of sustainability, uh, improving uh, environmental, social and also governance. So when you carry out surveys, this is all part of learning and growth eh? because surveys are a form of uh, research. So this could also be a uh, part of it. As an example, uh, when you conduct surveys on sustainability, you could do it every uh, three months, quarterly. You could every, do it even half yearly or you could do it even yearly. But I think yearly is a bit too long. Eh? So I'm suggesting that you can do employee engagements uh, half yearly. And you can incorporate questions on sustainability to gauge their understanding, to gauge their perception, and also to see whether they are committed to sustainability. So this sustainability KPI under learning and growth can look at measuring your sustainability uh, index. It could look at your uh, measuring your culture. For example, if one of your core values could perhaps be sustainability and you may want to measure um, sustainability as a core value okay that's learning and growth and then the last box is a uh, box number five which is a which is looking into the non-market perspective eh? so this are uh, this is optional you can stay with uh, four but the best uh, companies actually uh, add an additional perspective and this can be more from a uh, legal or legitimacy or compliance uh, perspective. Uh, as an example, you may want to look at uh, certifications. Eh? So how are you in terms of meeting the certification uh, requirements? Uh, so that could be one of the perspectives. Eh? Uh, in terms of legal, perhaps, eh? uh, there are organizations that I know who actually who look into number of uh, legal uh, suits that uh, people take out on them eh? so the legal department looks at reducing say for example from last year they had five legal suits then perhaps this year they want to reduce it to three or maybe to zero so those are some of the non-market perspectives that may be considered okay so that's uh, on the sustainability scorecard. Uh, before I move on to the next, uh, if there are any questions before we move on, uh, please uh, type them in the chat box and I'll be happy to answer them. I'm going to give you two minutes uh, to come up with your questions. Uh, it's best that you ask the questions now simply because I have the slide on uh, sustainability balance scorecard here uh, shown on the screen. Eh? So any questions? Please type them up. So while you're considering what to ask, uh, I just like to uh, revisit um, when we talk about justification we are talking not only about what to measure but we are also uh, looking at how and what you are going to uh, report how you are going to disseminate it uh, on our website uh, www.ungcmalaysia.org uh, under what we do the tab what we do uh, we have the SME SDG toolkit there you will find various resources under justification from uh, examples to various frameworks that you can use to report eh, uh, your sustainability progress to your stakeholders okay so since we have no questions i'm going to move on to the next topic eh? okay so the next one is going to look at the strategic analysis so you have already a vision for your sustainability you have a mission and then under your activities uh, under maju under your activities you have already implemented those uh, sustainability programs to look at reducing your impact on uh, the world whether it be from a social uh, government, uh, social or environmental perspective. Eh? So once you've done that, and then you've reported uh, on your progress, then the question is what next? How do I look at uh, improving? 
how do I set higher benchmarks how do I raise my ambition eh? because sustainability is dynamic you, it, it, it cannot uh, be stationary you must always move the um, goalpost so uh, I've chosen two of what I think is the best uh, tools uh, within permitted within this time uh, to share with you in terms of how you're going to look at uh, improving yeah? so the first one is the um, the pest analysis yeah? so the pest analysis is uh, a tool that we use to uh, look at what we call the political economic social and technological aspects yeah? some of you might be already familiar with this but um, familiar is one thing but whether you use it or not is another huh? often we have all these tools in fact uh, when you talk about social learning when you talk about uh, mass open learning we have so much content never ever like before huh? we've had so much content today that all you need to do is spend some time to find the best tools and then use it practice it because you don't need to hire an expensive consultant to write a uh, a sustainability roadmap for you when you can actually do it yourself okay so when we look at the pest analysis uh, this is one of our recommendations after you have done everything it is now time for you to look at what is the situation today eh? so we use the pest analysis it's a template for measuring or looking at external macro environment eh, which is at a very very high level uh, within the context of your industry yeah? it's a useful tool to understand uh, the various uh, components or dimensions uh, as shown here from the political all the way down to the technology so you it provides you with uh, a, a lens uh, or, or a couple of lens for you to look think of them as color lens uh, so you can use all these color lens to look at the various aspects that some uh, of us may not even consider it helps with arranging your or organizing your thoughts eh? because often we use when we start to think of our problems especially again when we go back to the decision making matrix tool often we make our decisions based on just thinking but we don't commit it to paper we are not analytical we are not uh, we don't use a process to come up with the best decisions eh? So when putting on your thinking cap, use the past analysis to, to frame and to help you come up with uh, your thinking eh, and organize your thinking. Uh, the past analysis is also used uh, for evaluating uh, potential for market growth uh, to look at even uh, in a post uh, analysis, in a post situation analysis, you can look at uh, the reasons as to why, for example, uh, the market is declining. Eh, why? Uh, a particular product or why a particular industry uh, especially one that you exist in is actually dying it could be a sunset um, sunset uh, industry yeah? and then sometimes it's expanded of course to look at uh, various other components huh? so you have political, economic, social technology, there's also legal and uh, environment uh, factors that you can look at huh? so when you look at uh, political you're looking at uh, from an ecological environmental issue today if you look at um, um, in the post uh, COVID-19 um, situation eh, uh, I was already expecting and I think uh, what I have been reading on the newspaper is uh, true because we at UNGC we have always thought that uh, during this economic crisis what's going to happen is that because business came to a standstill so government revenue was under threat and sure enough right after that I read in the newspapers and we've been following up we saw that um, governments began uh, extracting from mother nature more intensely yeah, to actually fill up their coffers to bring revenue yeah. so we read about the issue in Kelantan and Pahang you know how they were doing uh, logging so this was expected so you may want to look at say for example if you are in um, manufacturing of furniture for example so this uh, ecological environmental issues are a concern for you uh, simply because um, 
over extraction for example may create a very bad um, market uh, reception for your products and then you you can also look at uh, current legislations at home what uh, have the government uh, introduced especially um, while they talk about sustainability they may introduce uh, various blueprints such as the sustainability blueprint and so on and so forth they may uh, introduce uh, recently they introduced the digital my uh, digital blueprint which is also a uh, subject under sustainability simply because it enhances innovation and then you want you may also look into future legislations uh, wars and conflicts going on you know uh, i think the us and uh, china um, trade wars are a protracted uh, war and still continues to go on although it's happening behind the scenes today because they realize that you know it's uh, really creating a lot of havoc uh, for the rest of us and then you want to look at the economic impact uh, the home economy uh, you can look at the taxation issues you can look at specific specific uh, uh, industries so all the economic factors um, that is relevant to your business eh? and then you want to look at the social aspect uh, what has changed since um, the uh, health pandemic uh, today we were talking about you know how things are going to be a very different we talk about the new normal um, and again as a Malaysian having studied how Malaysians are the new normal is not really that different from the old normal <laughs> okay so when you look at it um, now that uh, everything the economy has started to open up uh, you can see the, the jams already coming back you know so uh, people are already uh, eating at restaurants and so on and so forth and but i really don't see any difference so uh, given that situation you want to look at so what is changing what has changed what will change um, for example uh, uh, one of the things that i think will remain in fact will grow is uh, online commerce uh, buying online i think that will continue uh, only for certain industries where like say for example makeup or even clothes may retail may actually still survive simply because uh, it's something that you want to measure uh, visually yeah? and then there's of, of course the technological aspect for you to consider what has changed in your industry uh, today if i go to the kedai mama if i go to the uh, grocery shop behind my house for example uh, even the Indian shop actually has uh, you can pay for groceries using your debit card eh? so that is actually an improvement that I've seen so digital adoption by even small SMEs uh, have become uh, much more prevalent today eh? and this the, the, the fact that people can pay with the debit card today is actually a technology uh, consideration for your business so uh, are you taking advantage of this um, situation in terms of the technological investments uh, is your company on board does your company uh, the products and service does it gravitate towards the market need today so these are some of the um, aspects that you might want to consider eh? okay uh, the last tool that uh, I find useful for you to look at how you're going to improve your uh, performance uh, be it from a business or sustainability standpoint is the quarters uh, five forces huh? uh, some of you may be familiar with it but i like this tool simply because it uh, helps frame where you stand in terms of this five uh, components huh? so the five components are of course when you talk about threat of new entrants, uh, bargaining power of buyers, you're talking about your buyers, you're talking about uh, substitute products, you're talking about the bargaining power of suppliers and the threat of new entrants. Huh? So this can be used from a sustainability standpoint uh, by looking at how your customers, uh, whether they are competitors who are already on board with sustainability or competitive competitors who aren't uh, already sustainable but is a force to be reckoned with uh, is a major um, uh, competitor to you uh. so what it's used for it's a, 
it's used as an analysis for assessing and evaluating the competitive strength of your business uh, uh, its position in relation to the industry yeah? and then it's also a concept to determine the, the intensity and attractiveness of a certain market so you may have three or four products uh, you may have three or four uh, services that serve different needs different markets so you could you can use this uh, quarters five forces to look at uh, coming up with uh, uh, an analysis of the various products that you already have eh? uh, but most importantly why i like this uh, quarter five forces is because it actually helps you identify where are the weaknesses and where the strengths are eh? so uh, i want to bring you back to the sustainability swot analysis uh, during uh, maju series part one uh, when you do this study you can also include uh, certain uh, points or aspects from the five uh, forces into your sustainability swot analysis so what it will tell you is that when you use it as uh, a, a tool you can look at where the weightage is eh? So meaning uh, in your industry or maybe in your certain products uh, of yours for example the problem that you have is actually more about threat of sub substitute products so it may be heavily uh, based on your industry or based on your products or services it may lean towards a uh, threat of substitute of products this may be where the greatest threats are uh, on the other, on the flip side, uh, you can also use it to look at where your strengths are. So, me meaning under the four or five forces, you may want to look at um, uh, where your strengths are in terms of uh, the five uh, forces. And it can also be used to, at the end of the day, as I mentioned, uh, to look at how you are going to attack. What is your plan of attack to improve on your existing products? or services that can that then can be translated into your um, sustainability SWOT analysis that and that can also be translated uh, back into your uh, business canvas and most importantly can also uh, contribute towards uh, your sustainability KPIs or your sustainability balance scorecards eh? So you can uh, take some of the pointers here, maybe in terms of um, a threat of substitute products, you can include that under uh, one of your sustainability KPIs, perhaps uh, you can put it under box number two, customer perspective. Um, you can uh, measure how uh, customers are, you want to stop customers from leaving your brand and going for the competitor, you could actually look at measuring that and eh? the threat of uh, substitute products eh? so how you use it basically is that we have uh, five boxes really uh, in total so number one basically looks at the uh, let's start with a uh, threat of substitution eh? this is uh, looking at how uh, customers are uh, switching um, from your products to the competitors eh? And then uh, you may also want to look at uh, how sometimes people switch between two brands, for example. Eh? If they don't get Coke, for example, then they go for Pepsi. Uh, that is an example. But what you really want to look at is whether who are those that are loyal to you, meaning in the ever-going uh, Coke versus Pepsi war, uh, how many people are really actually drinking Pepsi rather than using Pepsi as a, uh, an alternative to Coke? Eh? So under threats of substitution, uh, we want to look at the likelihood of customer switching. So customer switching is not good because you, then they become more like uh, customers to you eh? or rather they are just a sales figure for you. But uh, going for sales is never a good thing because um, often I say when I look at how the the Malaysian uh, food industry is, uh, especially when you look at uh, the F&B industry. Uh, for those of you in the SMEs, uh, this this is a special message that goes out to you. Uh, 
I often find that uh, for Malaysian companies, uh, uh, especially those in the SME sector, they tend to sell f- um, the, the quality of the food sometimes is so bad that I can only imagine the only reason that they do this is to actually get sales. Uh, but you are definitely not going to get repeat customers. Uh, so uh, the reason I mention this simply is because when you look at people switching uh, between uh, brands, uh, it's because when people switch, it's because they have an alternative. And sometimes the alternative is not something that uh, they like. They have a preferred brand. But because your brand may not be or your outlet may not be consistent, satu hari buka, satu hari tutup, dua hari buka, satu hari tutup, you know. So all these inconsistencies then uh, forces people to look at alternatives. Okay, so these are some of the threats that you may want to look at. Uh, why is it happening and how you are going to address it? Eh? So that is the threat of substitution. Then you have the supplier power. Eh? So this is when your suppliers actually start to determine uh, prices for you. Uh, supplier concentration may be when a situation where there is a lot of suppliers then the market becomes very uh, open and then very competitive where you are able to get suppliers uh, for essential uh, items uh, much cheaper eh? and then you know then they start to play with volume then they look at uh, various um, incentives for you to buy from them so in a situation where the supplier is rest with the supplier then that is a situation that calls for you to really look into your supply chain uh, because if your supplier is going to determine prices for you then you're going to be in trouble so what you like to do is uh, from a strategic standpoint look at the supplier power you need to balance it up and sh- to ensure that uh, the suppliers don't actually dictate things huh? today if i go to giant you know the Dutch lady, uh, one liter milk, the fresh milk. Yeah, I find that they control the market and they determine the pricing. Yeah, if they leverage towards uh, five ringgit per box, then everybody will go towards five. Today, uh, it's about five ringgit and eighty cents, and then everybody will move towards five forty. Uh, so, so this is where when I say. Uh, if the supplier has the power then you need to come up with strategies on how to control or how to overcome this problem of the supplier dictating eh? and then you look at uh, the threat of new entries Uh, so when you look at the threat of new entries this is going to impact on your business because uh, say for example you already have uh, 20% market share and in this uh, post-COVID era, there are new entrants, there are new startups coming up with great ideas, coming up with innovative solutions for customers. And then they start to switch costs because they are able, customers are able to do that because of uh, very attractive uh, prices. Uh, and that's the thing about uh, SMEs. Uh, this is the thing about um, startups. Huh? because you are small you are more agile and you are able to make decisions you are able to move faster and this is actually giving the big boys a big headache eh? because a lot of the smes a lot of the startups are upending business for the uh, big boys eh? so you got to look at the new entry the threat of the new entries you should actually do a study on them uh, to see uh, what are their target audience in fact, you can do a whole uh, five quarter forces uh, to simulate what your new entry is looking like. Eh? So, uh, what you want to do here again is uh, you want to look at how these new entries are posing a threat to you. Um, you need to look at perhaps um, various aspects. As I said, uh, I would. Uh, there was a time uh, in a company that I was consulting for. What they decided to do, one of the managers said, why don't we do or why don't we simulate a business plan based on our closest competitor? So as an internal uh, project, what they did was they assigned uh, various um, um, tools to their uh, managers, to the department to come up with the various, to, to populate the various tools with input 
but based on their competitors so that they would have actually a simulation of what the competitors uh, strategic documents might look like and that was uh, very interesting because it then really told them that uh, this company actually is much much more sophisticated in terms of their uh, approach to sustainability uh, in, in terms of marketing eh? and what it told them is that uh, they have a lot to learn uh, and they were far behind in terms of uh, having a strategic look at things eh? so uh, that is looking at uh, the threat of new entries eh? and then you look at buyer power uh, this is when the market actually determines um, the supply and demand eh? so when uh, things are skewed more towards the buyer then uh, this becomes the a buyer's market eh? so you want to look at uh, the buyer information who's buying from you their demographics uh, even their uh, geographical coverage uh, you want to look into the market penetration you want to look at market expansion you want to look at uh, share price uh, sorry uh, market share and so on and so forth eh? and then you want to look at uh, buyer price sensitivity i know for example based on uh, another consulting i did they were looking at coming up with a company that sells um, used uh, laptops eh? and they found that uh, there is actually a price sensitivity uh, when it comes to uh, laptops eh? although of course the used laptops when they come at a certain price a certain range uh, they all uh, have their own price brackets eh? but the magic point is actually uh, in the case that I'm sharing the magic point is uh, 850 below so anything 850 below sells better has better chances because the market out there is I think what the market is able to afford is actually looking at 850 and below anything beyond that even if it's just slightly 900 the psychological uh, barrier is there. Uh, 900 ringgit is the barrier. Even 899 doesn't work anymore. So 850 is the magic number in terms of buyers. Eh? So you might want to look into that because when it comes to buyers for your product, you may have that uh, magic number. Eh? And then what would be uh, the switching cost for your customers? Would it cost more for them to is there an additional cost for them to actually switch to your brand uh, can you actually lower that uh, switching cost can you make it uh, painless for them uh, in terms of money in terms of time in terms of process so these are all the considerations for buyer power eh? and last but not least is the competitive uh, rivalry eh? so this is the key driver uh, for the uh, capability eh, the number and capability of competitors in the market eh? because many uh, of your competitors may uh, take a different approach they may have their own unique selling propositions uh, which is why we have always said that uh, sustainability um, is uh, important and can be a major uh, differentiator for you eh? um, there was a survey done by global uh, reporting initiative uh, gri and the two reasons the two top reasons why companies embark or adopt sustainability is for these two reasons huh? number one is to enhance operational efficiency so meaning once you have enhanced operational effici efficiency your cost goes down productivity increases you make a savings and so on and so forth so I think that is very internal and that is good business sense it just makes business sense to and to adopt sustainability on item number one reason number one is good enough you don't need any other uh, reason to do so huh? the second most uh, cited reason for adopting sustainability is to increase uh, brand reputation or market reputation huh? so the relevance to a competitive rivalry today is um, are you going to use sustainability as a way to increase operational efficiency and also to look at how you are going to increase your market presence eh? so when I when we look at a rivalry you got to look at it in terms of how you are going to use uh, 
sustainability or use some of your unique selling propositions to differentiate yourself from the uh, market and the numbers the things that you need to look into are the number of competitors that you have um, you may have say for example you've identified a uh, 10 of the biggest uh, competitors eh? and then you may look at the size of competitors in terms of their market uh, share and then you can look at the industry growth rate uh, FMCG for example is going to grow by another 22 percent you know and then uh, what are the differentiators and then if uh, you say for example what would be the exit barrier when somebody actually gets kicked out of the market okay so these are some of the things that you need to look at in terms of the five quarters so you have the threat of substitution you have the supplier power you have the threat of new entries you have the buyer power and you have the rivalry uh, aspects eh? so what you do with this basically is look at the strength and weaknesses again this tool is very powerful only when you use it to complement the other uh, tools that we've shared with you especially tool number one which is the sustainability SWOT analysis number two is the you can also use the uh, decision making uh, analysis when trying to decide which way you're going to go in terms of your five uh, forces quarter you can use it uh, to come up and renew your sustainability one page business canvas you can also use it to enhance and complement your sustainability balance call cut okay so we have three minutes more if you have any questions please type them in i'd be happy to uh, take them on so three minutes Any questions? Again, while we're waiting, uh, just like to remind uh, participants that uh, we have all the tools uploaded on our website so please do visit us at uh, ungcmalaysia.org to download the various tools which are made free for you uh, the learning doesn't actually doesn't stop there uh, this we live in a over communicated society we've got so many free learnings so do take the time whatever we've presented to you are uh, the basic introduction to the topic you can further read about it on our website but also do deepen your knowledge by uh, going online to look for the various um, topics eh? okay so we've already provided the uh, topic thank you very much for the question <laughs> okay any other questions then then uh, okay thank you very much we've come to the end of our maju series part one and part two we've already covered here uh, from me i'd like to apologize for any mistakes uh, and i thank you uh, any feedback you can write to me uh, through uh, easy dot safri at ungc malaysia dot org okay thank you very much and have a good day have a productive uh, day ahead Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Najwa. Sorry, uh, Nabila. Okay, great. No worries. Okay, so that's great. Thank you so much, Izzy, for the wonderful session today. I hope you are all much clearer now on how to use um, the scorecard and tools for your businesses moving forward. I've already provided you with the link in the chat box below, so do give it a visit. So as today's session has come to an end, on behalf of UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei, I'd like to thank everyone again for making time in your busy schedules to join us. Um, but before I end this, I'll also like to, I'd also like to invite everyone to join us in our other available workshops for the rest of today as well as tomorrow. So to, 
today um, at 3.30 to 5 p.m. We've got a human rights due diligence workshop by BCSD Malaysia. And tomorrow we've also got a women in leadership workshop hosted by the Human Conversation. And then um, an introduction to ESG for SMEs as well by the Eden Strategy Institute tomorrow. So if you've not already heard this before, I'd like to also mention our upcoming event, the Go ESG ASEAN 2021 Virtual Summit happening on the 24th and 25th of November. I'll put the link in the chat box below as well so you can have a look and I hope to see you all there. With that, I wish you to stay safe and have a pleasant day ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.